and Bangalore for the last 23 years, where he is currently professor at Center for Nanoscience and Engineering and associate faculty at Mechanical Engineering Department. He has completed his uh, engineering from IIT Kharagpur and masters from Arizona University, USA, and PhD from Cornell University, US. Professor Rudhupradhap sir has given significant contribution in the search areas such as MEMS and MEMS devices, vibratory mechanical biology, mecha, uh, that is also known as mechabiology, and materials for MEMS and MEMS devices. And also, uh, there is a last number, vast number of research in MEMS and MEMS devices that are microelectromechanical devices and nanoelectromechanical devices. Today, Professor Pratap sir will be uh, taking topic on MEMS sensor technology. Okay. Uh, please uh, join me on welcoming sir. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here with uh, faculty members and uh, share my experience with you. This talk is just after lunch, and therefore I expect many of you to fall asleep. And um, I will therefore try extra hard to keep you awake. Now, um, just so that I know my bearings here. How many of you are here from other than electronics background? Anybody? Oh, wow. Wow. Oh, very nice. Okay. What background, sir? Computer science. So we have a mixed background audience, which is what I wanted. So I've just got what I wanted. Because this area that I'm talking about is very interdisciplinary. And you will see why it is interdisciplinary very soon. You will appreciate it better if you are a person who thinks um, across boundaries and not just in the silo where you have been trained. So it will help us all, you and me, in going forward in our discussion. If uh, we all know how to appreciate interdisciplinary research. So what I'm going to talk to you about is uh, MEM sensor technology. I'm pretty sure that everybody here has heard about MEMS. If you haven't heard about MEMS, it's not a crime, OK? I will, I will uh, spell out for you what MEMS is all about. That's my duty. And by the end of the lecture, I would expect that you walk out of here with a better appreciation for what MEMS technology is all about. And if you want to work in this technology, then what is required? Okay, what kind of things you should know? Why you should work in this technology? What, from national perspective, from international perspective, where is this field headed? And what kind of work, research work is required to take this field where uh, you know, we need it the most? All right, that's my goal. So I'll talk about sensors and smartness, sensing and transduction, MEM sensor technology, fabrication, and some examples. OK? I'll give you a couple of examples so that we have something concrete to think about and look at. OK. So MEM sensor technology is all about smart sensing. OK? Smart sensing technology. Now, you see, this is a this is just a projection by a few companies which understand this market of sensing very well. 
you know, they got together and they projected uh, this, this graph that how many sensors in the world will be used by, let's say, 2035, you know, another 15, 16 years. But what is really interesting is to look at what has already happened. No, so in 2007, in this graph you see that there were 10 million mobile sensors. Mobile meaning, you know, sensors which can easily go around. 10 million sensors which were used in the whole world, 2007. Okay? Roughly. Don't, now, you know, don't come up with a number tomorrow by looking at Google and say that, no, it was 10 million, 3,015. Okay, you understand the order of magnitude we are talking about. 10 million. By 2012, just five years, right, it went to billions. You see, it's more than now a year, it is about 6 billion sensors that were used by 2007. That's thousand, you know, several thousand times increase in usage of sensors. And you wonder what happened, right? What happened? How did all of a sudden this explosion in sensors took place? How? How did that happen? Now that's 222% year on year increase. Something that no industry ever sees. Okay, that kind of explosion. So, what made this change happen? And by the way, all companies, all marketing companies, uh, uh, market research companies rather, that study these things, not a single company in the world, with all MPAs from Harvard's and IIM's and wherever you can imagine, could forecast this, that this is going to happen. Okay? So, what happened? Right? It's, a, it's a good question. What happened? And then, so I'll tell you what happened. But then, <coughs> this is the forecast that we are going to require about 45 trillion sensors. 45 trillion sensors by, you know, 2035. Another 15. That's a mind boggling number. Okay? If you if you just divide that by the number of people who are going to be in the world by then, you roughly find that at least each person is going to use a few thousand sensors on you. Okay? You are going to use that. So, it's an amazing transformation in sensor technology that is taking place. So, now, I'll, I'll show you how that is happening, but let's go through this first one, okay? This, this one, that what happened? What happened was that this phone revolution, some of you have seen some of these, if you haven't, then, uh, you know, these pieces can be found in uh, museums, okay? You can go and see. But, you know, you have gone through this transition, you have seen this whole thing, and then arrived something called a smartphone, right? That explosion that I talked about was all because of smartphone, right? So, what is a smartphone? How did how did you figure out that a phone is a smartphone? Does anybody want to tell me? Why did you think that a phone is a smartphone? Your phone is a smartphone. Why do you call it a smartphone? What is so smart about it? features. Okay, so various uh, functionality. Various functionality. Speed is very high. Speed is high. All of those are all of those are right reasons. But I am asking you that when did you feel like your phone is smart? The response time is very less. The less. response time yeah. is very less. It depends upon the web. It depends upon the web. Or can you do a computer? So all of those answers, every answer that you are giving is a right answer. You know, there is not multitasking. Multitasking, all of that. But you know, 
to me. <laughs> to me, the first time when I rotated the phone like this and the whole screen rotated, yes. yeah. your eye go, 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 goes up, you know. Hmm. You know, you notice that. That how did that happen? Because you have never seen that on a computer screen, right? So how did it rotate the screen? How does it know that I'm looking this way? Right, sensors, right? So that's when you first realize that it is actually responding to you, right? Without you doing anything. All you have done is rotate the phone, but the functionality of the phone has rotated. So that happened because of sensors, right? So when you open the phone, now you find that, hey, this is not just something which has only one sensor. Even a dumb telephone, not the smart has a sensor, which is called a microphone, <laughs> right? It has to have a microphone. So it has a sensor. But now it has all these other sensors. These are accelerometers, gyroscopes, you know, uh, light sensors. You know that <coughs> in light it automatically changes the all kinds of things are there now, right? GPS. So all of these sensors that now you see in your cell phone, right now in your pocket, you are moving around with at least ten sensors in your cell phone, at least. But that's just the beginning, right? Now, going forward, you can see that it has only these functionalities, but going forward, it is going to have hundreds of functionalities just built into it. It's not anymore the compute power of the phone which has any limitation, right? Sensors, all sensors will demand a little bit of compute power. They will demand a little bit of processing, but that's not the bottleneck. Okay? So we are going to have tons of sensors sitting here, which will monitor your health, which will monitor your wealth, which will monitor everything. Right? And those, correct. So this is where all the explosion in sensing is taking place. Right? That uh, we have built these sensors which are so tiny that we can put them in these phones. More and more such sensors we come up with, we can put them. But who says that we only have to put in phones? Right? I mean, look at all of you. You know, many of you are wearing specs. It has a single function. It only focuses. That's it. But it is occupying prime real estate on your face. So much of space it takes. Why should glasses be only doing one function? Is there any reason? Why can't we embed 100 sensors in your eyeglasses? And the answer is yes, we can. And we have begun. So now if you start doing that, so that's just glasses. Just imagine what all you wear. You are wearing clothes, you wear jewelry, you wear watches. There you go. So now if you imagine that all of them have similar number of sensors, I'm already getting close to hundreds of sensors. You realize that, right? So you will be wearing hundreds of sensors, provided none of those sensors feel like that, oh God, there are wires running all across my body, right? As long as it's not the case, you are wearing the same earring, but it has sensors in it, and it is communicating wirelessly. You won't mind that. But if there is a hearing which has wires coming up, obviously you are not going to wear it, right? Or for that matter, you will. So that's where this whole technology is heading. Okay? So now you can see easily, you can imagine that you will have thousand sensors on you. And then you get home. <laughs> Plenty of space there for sensors, right? As of now, as of now, I'm working. 
with a company in Japan. This company came up with this thing, the company is called LiveSmart, and they asked us that if we can help them develop a smart air conditioner. Okay, so what is the smart air conditioner? It's not just what you see nowadays in advertisements, that okay, uh, adjust its temperature, you know, um, according to your wish. So the smart air conditioner that we are talking about is air conditioner which is connected to all air conditioners in the house, okay? And the moment you walk in, it knows what clothes you are wearing. And it adjusts temperature according to clothes, that's first level, and according to your mood. <laughs> if you are really, really unhappy, angry, you know, shouting at your husband or something or wife, then it knows that you need to cool down. <laughs> and it, you know, reduces the temperature a little bit more, okay? It knows that you are sitting in the living room and therefore there is no reason for the bedroom air conditioner to be running on. You know, you are wasting energy. It knows that you are sitting and watching a television program which is your favorite program and therefore you are not going to get out of there, out of that sofa for next half an hour. <laughs> and therefore it switches off all air conditioners other than the living room air conditioner. These kinds. Of so now, that's not just one sensor. It's not just temperature sensor. You see that, right? It has to have many more sensors which are communicating with each other, which are cross-verifying that, hey, this is what I'm thinking. What do you think, right? It's talking to the other sensor. So this is where you're headed. Now, you can see already the number of sensors, right? You pick up your handbag you know, from wherever you work, you know, from your desk. And just the way you okay. pick up your handbag, it tells the handbag that now this person is going to go. Okay? It's not the handbag which you move just to find something. The acceleration with which you all are familiar with that, okay. right? When we are going home, we pick up the bag and, you know, we start walking. The moment that happens, your bag is communicating back home that, aha, the boss is leaving now, you know, get the coffee machine going, you know, get things going, get the air conditioner going. So this is where we are headed. That's what smartness is all about, okay? So internet of things, when you hear, it's all about that. It will be so nice for me, right? I'm holding this device in my hand. Now, if, the, if all of your chairs had sensors in them, okay, and the chairs, and these sensors could figure out whether we are interested in this lecture or not, right? And I get live feedback that only 30% of these people are interested in your lecture and therefore shut up, you know, don't, <laughs> don't continue, just leave this room. It will save their time and it will save your time. <laughs> That would be wonderful, right? It would be such a good sort of uh, utilization. So that's what sensing can do, right? Sensing is what is the first step towards this smart. And since we are trying to now make everything smart, all man-made things smart, you are going to increase sensing many folks. That's where this explosion is going to happen, okay? And it's already happening. So now let's come back and look at the basic thing. What is smart? What, what do you think is smart? Now, you already know that to be able to call something smart or for yourself to be called smart, you first need sensing. You need to sense. What is smart? As you sense, you think, and you act. Do you think there is anything more than that in smartness? No. Right? You sense, you think, you act. Right? Act accordingly. Right? Process the 
the information, act accordingly, and that's what smartness is all about. So you translate that in engineering language, okay, or in, in scientific terms, it senses, processes, actuators, right, which have to work together to provide smartness. All right? That's where we are. That's where we are. So man-made intelligence is all about sensors, processes, and actuators. God-made intelligence is also about that, but it's at a very different level. You know, the zillions of sensors that you have in your body and how the information is processed so quickly, so fast, is still unknown to us. We are still trying to discover those bits and pieces. We are far from understanding it fully, right? You know, when you know this example very well, you meet a person, complete stranger, and sometimes you just, even before the person speaks, you know that you are going to get along with this person, right? You sort of have a rapport. How does that come about? From where? Right? So you, you know, there is something about that person that you can't even, even you can't articulate. That what is it about this person? You can't articulate. But all the senses, you know, the visual senses that you have, right? They are giving tons of information to your brain. And the, your brain is processing, it has some, you know, pattern mapping that it does inside. You know, that this person with this round kind of face with a long nose usually has this kind of characteristic which you like. You know, and all of that is happening inside without your knowledge. This pattern recognition or the cognition in human beings is an incredibly evolved process. Right? You know what I'm talking about, right? Have you had this experience that even without knowing the person, you sometimes get this feel. It's not every time that it will happen. Right? By now, all of you know that you're going to get along with me. Even though when I first walked in here, many of you had doubts. Okay? So, as you go along, your processes are evaluating continuously. Okay? How a person smiles, how a person reacts to different situations. That gives a lot of clues. You try to put that in words that, okay, you know, if the person smiles like this, then I think I like the person. You won't be able to do it. You won't be able to do it because it has too many things involved in there, too many parameters. And yet, your brain knows how to process that. Okay? And come up with a decision. So smartness, is these things, now we have figured out that this is what smartness is all about, and we are going to try to implement this in everything. What gives us that confidence? Because now we know we can make sensors and actuators at scales which nature uses. You know, you have insects, you have tiny insects, which have all of these, right? All of these. They can they can hunt, they can fend for themselves, they can find food, they can uh, reproduce, they do all of that. Tiny insects. So all the sensors, actuators, processes are built in there. Okay, so let's, now, you know, I'm going to teach a little bit about sensors and sensing. Because not everybody is from this field, so I want to carry you through till the end. Okay? I don't want to leave you in between. So senses and actuators, what is it about? So sensing typically is, you know, you are trying to convert one form of energy into another form of energy in the form of energy that you can easily record. That's what sensing is. And the most useful or the most, the, the easiest form of energy which is recordable is electrical energy. We know how to... Uh, record that, how to store that data, right? Therefore, whether it's mechanical energy or chemical energy or some other kind of energy, from there, if you convert it into electrical energy, 
that you can store, then you are doing work of sensing, right? Sensing requires that you do this. Actuation, on the other hand, is just the opposite, right? That you have electrical signal given to you, and you convert that either into uh, chemical uh, chemical energy or mechanical. You, you do some work, right? You know, motors, pumps. Those are all actuators. Okay. When I'm speaking, if I use a mic, then that is a sensor. It is sensing my voice, voice right? Sound that I'm producing. So actually, it senses this acoustic pressure and converts that into an electrical signal which then through the wire can go or wirelessly can go to uh, you know something else wherever you want to process it. In this case to loudspeaker. But what is a loudspeaker? An actuator. <laughs> because that takes this electrical energy and then it is pushing you know some diaphragm so that you have much louder sound than what I can produce. Right? So that's the actuator. So this, these, are, these are the things that we do with sensors and actuators. So if you want to work in this area, now mechanical energy, if you want to understand mechanical energy, what must you understand? You know, things like displacement, velocity, acceleration, force, pressure, temperature, your 12th standard physics. You remember mechanics, right? So all of that, that's what you need to understand. You need to be good at that. Similarly, if you want to do this part, Current, voltage, capacitance, resistance, inductance, you remember those terms? You've got to understand those things well enough. So once you have these, this understanding of these two areas, then you will be able to flow from one to the other with ease and you are on your way to become a great sensor expert. Okay? So let's take an example of, a, of sensing or of a sensor. So what is sensing? Sensing is that there is a, a particular kind of stimulus that you are interested in sensing, that stimulus. That stimulus comes on a black box, which is your sensor. And then from there, you get a signal out that you can store or record or manipulate. Right? So that's what sensors are. So how does this happen? Now, the stimulus comes on some kind of, you know, you have, built, you have built a structure, you have made a structure. The stimulus, let's just take the example of the microphone itself. You know, the simple enough. So what is the stimulus? It's the mechanical energy or the acoustic energy, right? Acoustic wave. As I speak, you know, whenever you speak, just put your hand in front of you and you can feel the pressure, right? Dynamic pressure variation. That's what you are trying to feel. That's what you are trying to gauge, sense, right? So you make a membrane so that it vibrates in response to this pressure coming in here. So you have that membrane and it vibrates and that's the mechanical response, right? That's the mechanical response of, of the structure. From that mechanical response, you need to do some transduction Transduction is conversion of the signal from one form to another. Some kind of transduction which gives you electrical signal. So what can you do? Well, the simplest thing you can think is, I have a membrane here, right? Which is what is deflecting because of sound pressure coming from here. And I put another plate here. I make both of these conducting, okay? Now these are conductors. When they are parallel, they are parallel plate capacitor, right? All of us know that. Now, if this starts moving, then what is happening is the distance between the two changes. If you remember the basic formula, C is equal to epsilon A by D, okay? Then you know that if D is changing, then C has to change, capacitance has to change. If capacitance changes, then in whatever circuit you put this capacitance, voltage will change, right? So I can record this change. Whatever deflection it is doing, that is recordable in terms of voltage. Fantastic, you got it, that's it. That's all you need, right? To make a sensor. So there it is. 
That's what happens. Pressure coming onto microphone, this person speaks, this is the dynamic pressure in time, this is your uh, diaphragm which is you know, vibrating and then on this side you have another plate and that is what is changing the capacitance which is then uh, getting recorded as change in volt. Right? You got it. That's what there is in sensing. Right? So this is sensors 101. This is the first course on sensors. Okay? So now that you know that you can build or you can make sensors easily, you need to understand transduction. Now you are getting into, into this area that, okay, I just learned about this capacity of transduction. Are there other transduction techniques? And the answer is yes, there are many of them. Capacity, piezoelectric, piezoresistive, optical, electromagnetic, thermoelectric, well, you know, a bunch of God has provided us with a whole menu of transductions. Choose whatever you want, right? And good thing is that physicists have worked on this forever. So we know lots of things about that. Okay? That how to convert this kind of energy to that kind of energy. Okay? I have highlighted these four because these four are the most popular in MEMS technology. Okay? Capacity, piezoelectric, piezoelectric, and optical. So, let's go ahead and look at a little bit of more example. How are you all doing? Okay? Yes. It's going okay? No problem? I don't need to wake you up? <laughs> panel plate capacitor. Okay? What is a panel plate capacitor? We all remember this diagram, right? Irrespective of what you did in college. This is high school. <laughs> 12 cent. So, this is what parallel plate capacitor is. Now, many of you may not remember the formula, but this is what the formula is. If you see it, then you will remember it. Okay. C is equal to epsilon A over D. A is the area of the plate. D is the distance between them. So, if, now, if the distance changes between the two, as I said, if it changes by an amount X, then you know that the Capacitance has changed. So, what is the change in capacitance? The original capacitance minus the new capacitance. Usually, it's not the absolute change which is of interest, it's change divided by the base capacitance. What percentage of capacitance has changed? Okay? What parts per million per billion has changed, right? And that's what delta C by C is. And you see that now your unknown X shows up right here. So, this can be measured and if it can be measured then you have an equation now in X which you can solve to find what X is. How much it has difficult? That's the first thing that you do when you design sensors. To know what is the relationship between the measure and the measure. Right? Okay? You put that to use and what do you get? Your cell phone screen, touch screen, right? This is called capacitive sensing. So all you are doing is, you know, when you touch like that, you know, the screen deflects, right? And capacitance changes and it is divided into so many uh, capacitors there that it can pinpoint where you have touched it, right? And then it knows what, what to do next. So this is so easy to do. Capacitive pressure sensors, just a diaphragm and another diaphragm in the back, another plate in the back, capacitive again, pressure sensor, right? So pressure sensor which is dynamic, pressure sensor which is static, both can be made. Dynamic pressure sensor is what microphones are that I already talked to you about. Now if you want to work in this area, then let me give you an example by which you will see what are the different parts, different blocks that you must work through to make sensors. Let us say that I'm making an accelerometer. Does everybody know what an accelerometer is? Something that the, the name suggests that it must measure acceleration, right? So whenever you have some motion, there is acceleration, okay? 
Now I know some of you must be thinking, no, what if it is uniform velocity? Yeah, but, but you are not taking JE, you know, there are no three questions. There is motion, there is likely to be an acceleration. Okay? So acceleration is to be measured. You know, your your cars, all of you drive cars, most cars today have airbags in them. Yes. How do the airbags know when to come out? By some impact pressure. Impact, impact on. Impact. What is impact? Pressure. Now, so how does the car know that it has impact? Of course, you will say that it, it must hurt the car. Crouch. You know, there is an impact. Which is true. I mean, the car gets hurt. But how does the car know what to do with that impact? Acceleration. Impact is deceleration. There is very high deceleration, incredible deceleration, you know. So there is an accelerometer there which senses that and it has a threshold that if it is this kind of deceleration, then it has to be an impact. It is not because this guy has braked the car. Braking will not produce that kind of deceleration. Only a collision will. So when it senses that, then it senses you know, this signal, electrical signal to the actuator that, hey, open. <laughs> and then, you know, the, the front opens and all of a sudden there is so much of high pressure air, which is not, it's not air, it's filled into the balloon Man. and, uh, you know, it comes out, right, to protect it. And all of that, mind you, must happen in milliseconds time. All of that, right? So, that was the first big commercial use of MEMS accelerometers, okay, which were used there. So what, what does the acceler, you know, how does the accelerometer work? Now acceleration, so some acceleration is coming. G is just to, you know, denote that it's acceleration due to gravity, G. How many Gs is the acceleration? So G becomes a unit of acceleration. So there is acceleration. Now, if Acceleration is working on some mass, then mass times acceleration gives you force. force. So you get some force, right? If there is a mass on which this acceleration is acting, you get force. Now this force, if you apply the force on a mechanical structure, then it's going to deflect the structure, right? So there is deflection of electrode. The electrode is a mechanical structure, it's just a plate or a membrane, it deflects that. And then from there, because you have put another plate, you get change in capacity. From there, you use a voltage readout circuit, okay? You get readout and at the end, you have motion or displacement. Now, why am I showing you in this block diagram is because this is how design is done, right? So we think in terms of blocks, what is the input, what is the output here, what is the input, what is the output here. So you can take a complex system, you can break it into smaller parts, and each part is a block. You should know how to put these blocks together, and then you design each block. You have your entire design of the system that you want, right? Now, do any of you know Simulink? Yeah. Right, so Simulink works like this, right? So you design each, now you program each of your blocks separately, you put the Simulink blocks together, and what do you have? A simulator for an accelerometer. So within a few hours, within a couple of hours, you can build a simulator for accelerometers using block diagram, right? So that's the use of this. That I, I use this all the time, to teach students how to build such things, yeah. So the sensitivity and range of this specific accelerometer, or on an average, hmm? the sensitivity and range. The sensitivity range. Yes, so this one. Yes. No, this is for this is for this particular yes, that's accelerometer. Okay. Uh, you get you get pretty good uh, sensitivities nowadays in, in accelerometers. So now let's come to MEMS. Okay? MEMS sensors. So MEMS, you know, um, of course I'm going to show you a little bit more examples of uh, how MEMS structures are made. 
But MEMS is a technology which is basically a planar technology. Okay, planar technology by that, what I mean is that you deposit materials in planes, you know, one, one, one plane at a time, thin films, right? And so you deposit a layer and you machine it, okay? You pattern it. And then you deposit another layer on top of it and then you pattern that. And then you do another one. What that does is that it limits you into making structures which are essentially planar structures. Simple planar structures. What are planar structures? Like a membrane, a plate, a beam, okay? Um, you know, those kinds of structures. So if you make those kinds of structures, then even if you have background in non-mechanical fields, like electronics, these are simple structures to master. It doesn't require four years of mechanical engineering training. But I mean, even mechanical engineers don't spend four years. It's usually two years. In any discipline, we spend only two years for our core <coughs> Right? The other two years have come. Um, you agree or you don't? Yes, yes, yes. Some material also showing planar structure. Huh? Some material also showing planar structure. Yeah. Huh. Materials showing planar structure like uh, you mean two D materials? We're talking about. Yes. Huh. So that is, but that's a. That's a different extreme altogether. When you talk about graphene or MOS2 or those, those materials, that planarity is extreme planarity, where you have a single atomic layer of material. Okay? So that does then quantum confinement in two directions, and you know, there's a different world altogether. By planar, I mean not that kind of 2D materials. I'm talking about planar meaning, you know, you have this is a planar structure. But it has oh well about uh, maybe two lakh nanometer thick. You know, right? So that's uh, two lakh times three, that's six lakh graphene sheets there. Right? <laughs> so it's a lot of, <laughs> lot of um, uh, sheets of graphene there, if it was graphene. So by planar structure, all I mean is, yeah, thin films. I'll show you an example of that. So it's usually the simple structures, cantilever beams, membrane structures, planar ensemble of, uh, ensemble of beams and plates, simple mechanical structures. You know, now, look. If you want to work in this area, then a little bit of mechanics you must know. Okay? A bit of mechanics is a must. All of you got that mechanics in first year, and then if you didn't stick with mechanical engineering, then you forgot that conveniently. That's okay. You know, same thing happened with mechanical engineers. They saw epsilon A over D in first year, all of electronics, and then later they forgot them. Right? But you can go back and you can recollect those things easily if you have seen it once, if you have been through it once. So these beams are simple structures. I should have. Uh, so what is a what is a cantilever? A cantilever beam is just this, right? This is a cantilever beam. Okay. So it has one end which is clamped and the other end which is free. Okay. So cantilever beam is. Just this, if you take a beam like this, okay, that's more like cantilever plate. Okay? So if it was if it was a thinner structure, not this this wide, if it was thinner, then it would be considered a beam. A beam for all practical purposes is a one-dimensional structure. Okay? We do not care about its width, we do not care about its depth, we care about its length. Okay? All the action happens because of the length. So you have a beam like this, you apply a force on it. If you apply a force, there is a deflection that is well known. You know, this is my favorite example. I say that a true mechanical engineer is defined by this fact. That you wake up the person in the middle of the night and ask him, what is a cantilever deflection for? <laughs> and they say, PLQ by 3i, sir. 
then they are true mechanical engineers. Okay. There are mechanical engineers sitting here, right? You agree? Yes. Huh? So, <laughs> so this is this is as basic a formula as that. So what it means is that if I apply a force on it and if it de deflects by a certain amount, then the force divided by the deflection gives me stiffness of that structure, right? I need more force to deflect by the same amount a structure which is much more stiffer, right, than a compliant structure, okay? You take, uh, you take this wooden thing, right, and, um, you know, like this, and you apply a force on it, okay, it will deflect. If it was a steel plate, right, and clamped here, do you think that by doing this I could deflect that? No, no right? Steel is far stiffer than this one is, right? You, you do these experiments easily at home, okay? Uh, you know a ruler. A ruler is a, hey, Piyush, kisi ke paas ruler hai kya yaan pe? Steel agar ho to aur bhi badiya. Then I can uh, show you lots of demos with that. So, load divided by deflection gives you stiffness. You did those experiments in high school when you were least interested in understanding these things, right? With a spring mass system. You put the mass, you measure the deflection, you put more mass, you measure more deflection and more, and then you know you are asked to draw force versus deflection curve. And then somebody told you that if you take the slope, that's called the spring stiffness K. You did all that, but under compulsion, not because you were curious, but because it was a lab, right? So, what you know? By the way, this is spring thing, spring and mass thing, is that spring and mass example that is given in high school physics. That's mother of all oscillators, okay? And that equation that you see for the first time for spring mass motion, that's the equation on which you can build your entire career, if you like, okay? Spring, the oscillators, okay? Or still in the Keep his name as well. So I can I can hold it here and you can see it, right? So easy. You know, at home to do these experiments when you are bored, when you have nothing better to do, you know, make a hole here <laughs> and you can do this and find out what is the stiffness of this thing, right? But the stiffness is not an intrinsic property of the ruler. Okay? Right? So now if I do the same force, much less deflection, correct? Right? So length matters. So you already know that length matters. Now I'm holding it very tight. If I don't hold it very tight, right? So it also depends on boundary conditions. So stiffness is a function of geometry, boundary conditions, and you already know by intuition that if I did exactly the same experiment with exactly the same length, exactly the same boundary condition, but with steel, it would be different, right? So material properties matter too. So stiffness is a function of all of them. Right? So I can find out that how stiff this is by doing this kind of experiment. So stiffness tells you that given a certain amount of stimulus, mechanical stimulus like force, how will this deflect? How much will this deflect? Okay? Less, lesser the stiffness, more deflection I can get for a given force, which means I can make it more sensitive, right? Then I apply a tiny bit of force and then also it will deflect, right? So that gives you, uh, you know, a major of how sensitive I can make it. Yeah. Great, thank you.
This is, I'll, I'll show you the same experiment I can show you. But this is much better for another reason. So that is static deflection. And that's with spring stimulus. So spring and mass, when it is taught in schools, you know, at that time, we are not matured enough to understand what they are trying to teach us. Okay? So this, this picture that sticks in your head for throughout your life is that there is a block, which is the mass, and there is a spring, which is like a spring that you have seen. And both these things, spring masses, are far from a real mass and a real spring, by the way. These are mathematical objects. A spring and a mass, when it is taught to you, is a mathematical object. It's not a real object. A mass does not have any elasticity. It doesn't have any stiffness. It, does, it only has mass. It is only capable of inertia. It is only capable of kinetic energy. It cannot store any elastic energy. That's what that mass is in the model. The spring has no mass at all. It has only potential energy you store it, right? It can only compress or elongate. It has no mass whatsoever. It has no kinetic energy. So it's a mathematical object. Remember that. So a mass denotes inertia and spring denotes elasticity. So these are two properties of the same structure. <coughs> Here is the beam, right? It has mass and elasticity both. So it is a spring and a mass. Now you have to find out what should the mass be and what should the spring stiffness be. And that's what I was telling you. OK? So now, if it oscillates, you know, the spring mass model that you know, if, if the spring mass model oscillates like this, then you know that its uh, frequency is given by square root k over m. Some of you might remember that, right? Square root k over m is that. All the mechanical engineers will remember. Okay. So uh, all the electrical electronics people also remember for RLC circuits, right? Okay. So now here is here is this beam, right? Oscillates. What do you think is the frequency? Okay, guess. What is the frequency of oscillation? Ah, not the definition. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, what is the number? About? About 3, 4. In one second, how many cut cut? Right? <laughs> That's good. Okay? So 3, 4 hertz. That's the frequency. Frequency increased. Right? I decrease the length, the frequency increases. Very high frequency, right? Now you can't distinguish the, you know, individual beats, right? But it's there, right? So now it's already getting into kilohertz. So now you imagine that if you shrink this beam, what you saw was that I was reducing its length. Now you reduce it to micron scale, okay? Micrometer scale. How much micrometer? Your hair diameter is 100 micrometer. That's the ruler now you are going to use from now on as we go along. Your hair diameter is 100 micrometers. So all your life, you have in your head that this much is about 1 millimeter because you have been staring at this all your life, right? That how much is 1 millimeter. I just changed that for you now. Your hair diameter is 100 micrometers. Roughly speaking, now don't get me into, oh, I use parachute oil there for my, yeah, uh, yeah, it would be different, but, yeah, uh, on an average, it's a good, good ruler to use, 100 micron. So now, go 200 micron long beam, which is about 5 microns wide, maybe 2 microns thick, 
What do you think is the natural frequency of that? It gets into mega Okay? So now these beams, MEMS beams that we make, these are mechanical structures and yet they have megahertz frequencies. Okay? We can push very hard to go to nanoscales. Okay? Make <coughs> nanoscale beams and we can even push them to gigahertz. Mechanical structure vibrating like that is unimaginable because we never had this kind of thing before that we could do. We did not have tools to make these tiny, tiny, tiny structures. That's what nanotechnology is all about, giving you the ability to manipulate matter at the scale where you can machine these parts to such small length scales. Okay? So when you get to megahertz, now, here, now this, this experiment, I wish I could do, uh, doesn't look like I can do that. Key ring I can, no. Okay, now what do you think will happen if I add some mass to it at the end. Frequency will increase or decrease? It will increase. All of you saw that formula. Too bad. Square root m over k. k over m. Right? Frequency will decrease. Okay? If you add a mass at the end. So now, take a giant leap in your imagination. Imagine that this beam is 100 micron or 10 micron long beam. Okay? And a bacteria which is just about one micron wide comes and sits there. Okay? The frequency would change. So now <coughs> this tiny beam, if I can measure its frequency before the bacteria sits and after the bacteria sits, I can make out the change. And from the change, I can figure out the mass of the bacteria. We have just made a weighing machine for bacteria. <laughs> we just made a weighing machine for bacteria. Remember? Now, this weighing machine didn't exist ever before. So, we have pushed this limit to the extent where we can now measure the mass of single molecules. Biological molecules. Virus and bacteria, there is a good weighing station for them now. Okay. So I have a colleague at my center, Akshay and I, who works precisely on this. He has been able to measure 10 to the power minus 21 grams. 10 to the power minus 21 grams. None of us in this room have any intuition of what that means. 10 to the power <laughs> so this is, are you guys having a good time so far? <laughs> okay. It's one thing to know the number, exponent. You know, if I ask how much is one nanometer, all students coming from middle school today, okay, or high school, they tell me immediately the reason, 10 to the power minus 9 meter cell. And I say, okay, show me with your hand. How much is that? Show me. How big is it? <laughs> no, and obviously they can't. Not only they can't, you can't. Right? Because you have no intuition of that length. You know it as a number. One billionth of a meter. So big deal. How much is that? Do you have, even if you close your eyes, can you see that? You are splitting your hair, literally, now into one lakh parts, vertically, 
you know, not working. <laughs> Vertically, one single layer in one lakh parts, and that's one nanometer. Can you imagine, you know, one lakh part of your single hair? It's so hard. So that's just 10 to the power minus 9. We are talking about 10 to the power minus 21 grams. What intuition do you have there? Zero. Right? So these numbers are, you know, these exponents are always crazy exponents. You've got to think about them a lot before you get intuition about them. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll give you another example which happened out of fun. So my son, who was a high school student, he he was doing something, and they were doing something about Avogadro's number. I said, "Do you do you understand anything about that number, ten to the power twenty-three? Does it mean anything to you?" He said, "Yeah, ten to the power twenty-three. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a big number." I said, "How big is it? Do you know?" You know. But it's very big because it has 23 zeros. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, think about it. And, you know, tell me something which sort of gives you a view of this number. So the next day, he comes and throws it back at me. And he says, okay, tell me how much is one Avogadro number of rice? Okay, so you treat each rice as a particle. So how much will be Avogadro number of rice? Okay? I mean, how much rice will it be in one Avogadro? And then I said, now that's a very cool question. And we sat down and did calculations that so far in humanity, all the rice that we have produced does not add up to the All the rice ever since you know agriculture was discovered, 10,000 years ago. You do this calculation. Whatever is the current production of rice, you know, it doesn't take a genius to figure out, you know, on an average, you know, how much rice is in one kilogram or whatever, right? Because you, you just take a handful of rice, you know, maybe 100 grains, weigh it on a weighing scale, weighing scale, and then multiply by numbers to see. <laughs> we found that we give all generous amounts every year. So whatever rice we produce right now, we said, okay, let's assume that the same rice was produced for 10,000 years, okay? We know it is not true, far from the truth, but let's, all of it came to 10 to the power 17 rice grains. So these numbers, these exponents are not something that you can build intuition about so easily. Okay, so whenever you think about such things, think about them quite a bit before you, you know, commit to them that this is what it means. So this is, now this is a good cantilever, right? And you can make it much smaller than that, okay? This is, this was, uh, this is made in our lab and this is 500 micrometers here, no, 50, 50, 50 microns, right? So it looks like this is a 50 micron long cantilever beam, okay? And you are talking about, now you have built a platform here, you know, to attract some bacteria, virus to come and sit here and figure out the change in frequency, okay? Right? So this is, this is something that you can easily do and you can get these resolutions to be so fine with this technology, okay? How do you measure this, all of this? Hey, how long is this lecture supposed to be? Manu, do you know? Till 3.30. Huh? Till 3.30. Till 3.30? Yeah. Are you okay with that? Yes. Okay. okay. So uh, there are instruments. This is called a laser Doppler vibrometer that you can put this, this beam raw on the wafer. You can put it here. You can excite it with electrostatic actuation and you can, you can measure uh, with laser beam falling on it through Doppler shift, you can measure what the frequency of oscillation is and what the amplitude of oscillation is. So you can do these kinds of experiments today. You know, this is this is another beam which is oscillating, and we can 
see the first mode, second mode, third mode. Actually, we have seen 49 modes of the structure, you know, in oscillations, and we can record it. So you can do these experiments. Some main structures, other main structures. Now, I showed you beam, uh, a beam. Now, this is another beam which is in L shape, and that is holding a whole, four such beams are holding a whole uh, plate, and this is an accelerometer. There is a much more complicated structure, which is a gyroscope. Gyroscopes are the ones that measure rate of rotation. Okay, so these are all made in our in our uh, center. Okay, in our ISC band. So this is this is the first uh, analog devices MEMS accelerometer, which was used in airbags, and this is where the mechanical structure is. Okay? This is the mechanical structure, which looks like this. You know, there is. This beam, which is in the form of a uh, bent tube or clip, okay. So this is the spring, and there is another plate-like structure, which is uh, plate-like structure, which is called proof mass. Another beam, which acts as a spring. <coughs> so this is again a spring mass system, okay. And there are uh, comb drives here, which act as sensors. You build, you you can make fancy structures like this with uh, this is from one of my colleagues Alan Suresh who works on compliant structures for accelerometers this is a package accelerometer this is a gyroscope this gyroscope is also if you look at it it has this beam right and it is holding a plate in the middle okay so this plate this plate there are two of them and these beams hold it so that beams can oscillate Beams can act as uh, springs. Let me see if this uh, thing plays here. Okay, how do gyroscopes work? I'll, I'll just show you. Um, so these two plates are supposed to oscillate like this. Okay? And they have combs here, comb drives, like this. So you can use these comb drives to oscillate them. So they will oscillate because these this, uh, beams can flex, right? So it's a beam like this, and you have a structure here, a plate sitting here. So this beam can easily flex like this, okay? And it can vibrate. Now, these, these comb drives here, you apply electrostatic force between combs, and therefore, the electrostatic force starts pushing them in, Okay, but the elasticity wants to bring it back, and therefore it will start oscillating if you apply AC voltage. Okay, so it oscillates like that, like this in plane, and if you apply a rotation, okay, about this axis. So this is this is the axis about which rotation is being applied. So it is oscillating like this, and the moment you start rotating it about this axis. Then these two plates, because of Coriolis acceleration, they start going up and down. So they are going like this, and they are also going up and down. So the moment they go up and down, you can put another plate here. That's your parallel plate capacitor. It is moving up and down. Now you know how much it is moving up and down. So from there, you can figure out through Coriolis acceleration term, what is the rate of rotation which has been imposed on. So you just made a gyroscope, right? So Coriolis acceleration acts like this. You see these guys happily throwing a ball at each other, and the ball reaches each other. But now it is rotating. Now the platform is rotating. And now this guy, if he throws the ball, it doesn't see he's, he's aiming at him. But it's not going there, because there is Coriolis acceleration. OK? So it's like this, that you have here, this ball is being thrown like that. So velocity is in that direction. But the moment you apply a rotation, then there is a Coriolis force which acts in this direction, perpendicular to both V and omega. OK? It's, uh, it's, a, it's a Coriolis acceleration is a term which is omega cross V. So it's perpendicular to both. And that's why the ball goes away. Okay? So this is your. Uh, uh, Coriolis force sensor. 
So we can make, based on that principle, we can make this gyroscope, these are the structures, uh, this is an optical image, this is the design, this is the optical image, this is, as you can see, this is the standing electron microscope. Those, those home drives that I told you about, they look like this, okay, if you look close enough. So these are home drives, if you apply voltage between this and this, then you know, there is electrostatic field set up between the two and they start attracting each other. And actually, you can, even this should work. Let's see what's, what's going on here. You see, so this is actual structure, actual MEMS structure, gyroscope. And all we are doing is applying voltage between these two and starts, uh, you know, yeah, it gets actuated. Now, obviously, this is being shown at this frequency just so that you can see it. Actually, it's moving at 7 kilohertz, so it goes very fast. You know, you can't see it at that speed. You can see the whole structure moving, right? And here, actually, if you pay attention, so this is your eye test, <coughs> okay? Can you see both structures moving? Yes, sir. Ah, good, good eyes. All of you passed the eye test. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, you can do instrumentation to see that uh, when rate of rotation is applied on it, that it actually does uh, move up and down, which can be sensed by uh, capacitors. And uh, you get a pretty linear response uh, for different rates of rotations we measure. But, 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 okay. So that is, that is the gyroscope that we make, okay? Now the gyros, which are actually used in aeroplanes, are big and heavy gyros. They weigh, typically they weigh 20 kg, okay? And the ones which are used in ships, they weigh tons. Those are mechanical flywheel uh, kind of gyroscopes. Now, what we have done, meaning MEMS community, including people like me, um, we have made gyros which are on a chip. <laughs> they weigh less than five grams. Okay. Once you put electronics and all, okay, maybe okay, 20 grams. Okay. But, uh, but they do weigh far less than those gyros. Okay. So when you make gyroscopes like what I showed you, you feel so good. Ah, I'm the king. <laughs> you know, look how smart I am. <laughs> we can make this so tiny, the whole world has been described like this. Okay? And then you look at how nature does it. Nature also has gyros. It's a gyros which it doesn't find fancy things like aeroplanes to put gyros on. Gyros are also put on uh, missiles and stuff, but now gyros are in your pocket because it's in your cell phone, right? Only after MEMS came in, it is in your pocket. Otherwise, it was only in those things. Nature puts it on insects. How do insects know how fast they're rotating or which way they're rotating? When you rotate, you have a lot of visual information, okay? Because you have a bigger brain to process that, and therefore you know that. Your gyros also work differently. If the visual information wasn't there, all of us have played that game, <laughs> childhood, and you see how you fall, <laughs> right? So when the visual clues are not being processed fast enough, then the only gyros acting in your, inside your ear. Those are the only ones that act in cochlea. In cochlea. Are you aware of the yes, gyros sir. that you use? Yes, sir. That's the only place where God tells you that he understands Cartesian geometry. Because there are three tubes perpendicular to each other. Exactly perpendicular to each other, right? oriented X, Y, Z axis, you know, you can see those three tubes. That's fantastic demonstration of nature's understanding of everything. So here is this fly which is flying and there is this 
tiny organ here. Can you see this white one? Yes. It's called hortier. The hortiers are this hortier, tiny organ here. That is the gyroscope for the fly. Okay? Now, the way it works, when the wing is going up, the hortier is going down. Right? And so it's out of phase motion of the hortier with the wing. So when flies fly, then these hortiers are also going up and down. So they are being actuated. They are oscillating. And when the fly rotates, then again the Coriolis acceleration acts on this. And it starts moving this sideways just tiny. But the sideways stiffness of this hortiers is very different from its stiffness in the skillet. And we have measured all of that. Okay? And we found that it's from the sideways deflection that the strain produced from the sideways deflection that it decodes and from, from that de decoding it understands the rate of rotation. But the beauty is that it uses just this tiny structure for all three axis rotation. With all my smartness and nanotechnology, my, what I showed you was a single axis rate of rotation gyro. Okay? And this is all the three axes. This is the structure. There is a mass. It requires a mass because it's inertial sensor, and therefore at the end it has this block, right, sitting there. So we did a lot of experiments to figure this out. And biologists told us that probably it is used as a gyro. They don't know how. So we studied it with a PhD student. She worked for five years on this to figure it out. What biologists did was they cut this organ off in flies and let the fly fly, and then the fly fell down. So the fly could not figure out its rates of rotation and it could not stabilize itself and it fell down. So that's how they figured out that it is used as a gyre. And then we came in and we figured all out that how does it work. You know, this is this is the cartoon that is, there is a Coriolis force acting on it. How does everything uh, gel? How does all the mechanics work out? We work those out. Okay? So but we haven't yet been able to create a MEMS gyro, no, based on this principle. What we have is different. But when we saw nature's design, we said, this is way too smart. We are just not smart enough to mimic that design yet. Okay? We don't understand how to do that with a, such a tiny, simple structure to get all the three uh, rates of rotation. What we do understand is how does the fly do it? That's all we do. Yeah. So did you cut the that structure also, that tiny structure? Yes. Yes, yes. We did. We did. We we cut. We uh, we we analyzed. We took cross sections. We took uh, micro CT scan because when we were modeling it, just by looking from outside, we were not able to get the kind of stiffness that we were measuring okay, from our models. So we realized that, is it possible that it's hollow inside? We were assuming that it is solid. Okay? So we had to look at the structure. We did micro CT scan. Then we found that. So you know, those details I'm leaving out because obviously I don't have time. But yes, we did. Then there is ultrasonics. Ultrasonics, ultrasound, everybody knows, you know, if you have gone to the doctor, uh, you know, for for some kind of inspection, the most common thing is when there are, you know, expecting mothers, then they do ultrasound to see the babies, and uh, everybody gets to see ultrasound, whether you are a man or a woman. So we we work with ultrasonics. We make MEMS ultrasonics. So these are called PMUTs. These are piezoelectric micro machine ultrasound transducers. So these transducers are very tiny, and this is made of four different materials. You now you have a passive uh, structure, which is usually silicon. Then you have an electrode, which is metal. 
Then you have active material, which is piezoelectric material, in this case PZT, and then you have another top electrode like a gold. If you look at the membrane, this membrane, then it looks like this. This is the actual structure. In cross section, it looks like this. And you know, once you excite it, once you apply voltage on it, it does vibrate. So we have made these kinds of devices. We have uh, been able to excite them in all kinds of modes. And amplitude versus voltage graph, if you see, it's very linear. That means more voltage you apply, higher is the amplitude of vibration, higher will be the acoustic field generated, right? So you can, you can do more powerful ultrasonic waves by applying higher voltage. And uh, you can see here, this is, this is where our MEMS ultrasound is, and this is the traditional ultrasound, OK? And you can see that as it is brought closer, you know, you see the change in signal. That means our, our sensor, our ultrasound sensor, is picking up these signals. What do we want to do with it? Now, because these are tiny, these are MEMS ultrasound sensors, we can put them in uh, microfluidic channels. We make microfluidic channels. We can put them at the bottom. And if there are cells, blood cells passing through there, we can detect them. You know, just by firing ultrasound, we can detect them. We can also figure out how many cells are going by. With a little bit of more work, we can also figure out whether the cells which are going by are healthy cells or cells with disease. OK, because they produce different signals. So we have been working with these kinds of devices. Here is the same uh, PMUT. We put it in fluid. One PMUT here, one PMUT there, or an array of PMUTs here, array of PMUTs there. The fluid is in between. And by doing this experiment, we have been able to uh, find or sense the density of a liquid. Okay density of a liquid. Now, because these are tiny, you can put them anywhere you like. Okay? Also, when you are mixing two fluids, as it is done in chemical industry, two fluids or three fluids you are mixing, you want a particular concentration coming in, right? particular uh, ratio, mixture. If there is anything going wrong, then you can detect that because the density changes. So you can do it dynamically too. And uh, you can see that the static measurements, dynamic measurements, both are picked up and both give you very good you know, results. That means you make a sensor which can be used in an in, in industrial uh, setting. You, yeah. And ultimately, that good looking apple that you just bought from the market because it was shining, it was looking so good, and you brought home and you cut it open and it's rotten inside. Yeah. Right? We have all experienced that. How do you feel at that point? That's a bloody fellow cheated. But even that fellow might not know. So how do you figure that out before you buy it? So that's what I was telling you, that all these sensors are going to be in your pocket. It's going to be in your cell phone. You, we will have our PMATs here. You shine the PMAT on this, and it will tell you whether it's <laughs> rotten or not. That would be cool. <laughs> Neat thing to know. How does that work? Now, if I if I have both sides ultrasound sensor, if the ultra ultrasound wave goes through this, whatever is the material inside. The attenuation of that ultrasound wave on the other side depends on what is inside. Okay? So if it is crunchy apple, you will get a different signal. If it is rotten apple, you will get a different signal. So all you have to do is train it on a few of those samples. And then you know that what does the signal of the rotten apple look like? What, okay? And that. Radiation. Sir, so, there would be ultrasonic radiation, and there is a metal that is actually we are eating or consuming. So there would be some effect of that radiation in that particular. No, but ultrasound. This is ultrasound. You know why ultrasound? Ultrasound is used for 
uh, imagine babies. Why? There is a need. Huh? Yeah. We don't know any uh, bad effect of ultrasound on babies yet. Actually, I keep thinking that maybe in ultrasound we should have songs so that when we do that, the babies can probably pick up if, if uh, they are sensitive to ultrasound, they can learn music right then. <laughs> but uh, anyway, <laughs> that apart, ultrasound, all acoustic waves have very little energy in them. Okay, and that's why it does not affect you. And therefore it is safe. I guarantee you that the apple you eat after putting two ultrasounds <laughs> will be completely healthy. <laughs> We make pressure sensors, you know, we have made pressure sensors. This was a project that came to our center uh, from defense. You know, LCA, when LCA was being made, LCA is light combat aircraft. Um, they had issues with pressure sensors. Five pr uh, pressure sensors are used in the cockpit. And, uh, you know, whoever their partners were, Israel in this case, they refused to give them this census. So they came to us that, can you build this? We started with uh, a wafer, uh, you know, making the pressure sensor, doing uh, wire bonding, putting it on a header, packaging it with rest of electronics in it, all of that done. And this was done by two of my colleagues, although I'm a I'm the lead investigator of this project, but these are the colleagues who actually do the work. Professor M.M. M. Nye and Professor Kane But They built this entire thing, and it has been tested in LCA, and today these pressure sensors are flying in HAL helicopters. Okay. So all the way from our lab to commercialization. Okay, so now these sensors are produced by a company that I founded, I2N Technologies, and I2N Technologies supplies this to whoever wants it. So if you want it, you can order it, <laughs> go to the website. As I said, so you know, technology transfer was done to both BEL and I2N Technologies. I2N Technologies has moved much faster than BEL, and they have made it already. We made a consortium of three companies, I2N, Centrum Electronics, and Civil Systems. We call it Indic MEMS to make MEMS products. Oh god, I'm running out of time. I just want to give you a little tinkle here. There is so much of room for uh, this MEMS census in agriculture. You know Indian agriculture uses hardly any technology. When we talk about technology in Indian agriculture, we still think of tractor in the place of the bullocks, okay? And now a thresher in, in place of doing that, right? That's, that's our understanding of uh, introduction of technology. But sensors could do wonders in all of these areas. You see production, storage, consumption, all three areas. In production, soil health. How do you know the soil health in which you are putting? You know, this year, what kind of micronutrients are present in the soil in which you are going to grow? You know, chana or whatever, wheat, whatever it is. Seed health. You have bought the seed, but do you know the health of the seed? You are just taking it on face value, right? Do you know that this is the best seed that you could get? Crop health, harvesting conditions. Similarly, in storage, which is something that I'm working on, input grain quality, storage monitoring, in storage, what happens, you know, uh, does something. Do you know that how much grain is lost in storage in uh, godowns in our country? I'm sure that you have seen newspaper articles every year. In 2017 or 2016, it was worth 56,000 crores. Spoil, you know, grain which got spoiled. That's a huge staggering number. How does it get spoiled and you don't even know? Right? Because there are, there are no sensors. There are no sensors to tell you that your grain is spoiling. Well, you know, the, the grain storage is there. And when sitting, you know, these officers sitting 
you know, 100 meters away from the store in the office, when they can't do any more free breathing, then they know that something is going wrong. <laughs> That's your level of sensing. And then by the time that happens, you go there, you have to throw the game. You cannot do anything else. So this is how our FCI go-downs look like, right? Food Corporation of India go -down. Actually, this is in Bangalore, which is a much better go -down. I don't know what does it look like in FCI go-downs in India. <laughs> so um, <laughs> it's much cleaner. We went there to photograph my students went there. But this is what a server storage looks like. Look at this contrast. Okay? So this is where your this byte lives. Food byte. This is where your data byte lives. Look at the contrast. Okay? Absolutely air conditioned, you know, full of sensors for temperature, hot spots and whatnot. You know, ask yourself, what does your life actually do by now? Well, kids of today's generation will probably go for this, but someday they will be like that. That's not true. So, you know, it's, it's this kind of thing which bugs me that how come we don't have sensors here? You know, when we went there and asked these guys that how do you, how do, what kind of, uh, Monitoring? Do you do? Do you do any monitoring? Of they said yes. We have probes, and we were very impressed that they have probes. Okay, so we said, okay, what are these? Can we see the probe? What was this probe? It was a danda. <laughs> At the end, it has a spoon. So then you just push it in the sack, and take out, <laughs> take out the sack, and look at it whether it's rotting or not. That's the probe. <laughs> That's the state of technology, ladies and gentlemen. It's very sad, right? There is no reason why we can't have sensors in our storage uh, places to, to figure out what is happening with our brain. I'm working on it myself, personally, to actually, I don't want to tell you the whole story, but <laughs> this, uh, this sack that you see, the juice sack, the humble juke sack is going to be a very smart sack very soon. Okay? It will have nose, it will know when something is rotting, and much before you do this, it will send you lots of messages, data, saying that, hey, pay attention, something is going on here. So we are working on that. Okay? The future looks like this. That, you know, you know how um, your chips are, you know, memory chips, all the electronics people here know memory chips or processing, you know, the, the, the logic chips, what do they look like? They're still, you know, two-dimensional structures, right? The future is like this, that where you will have, you will have CMOS chips, you will have your memory and logic sitting there, but there will be other sensors in the same stack, in the same wafer, okay? So it will be a 3D stack in the same way for you are making at one layer you have drug delivery, health monitoring, another layer energy storage, some sensors here, uh, your memory logic here, you have RF communication uh, on the top. All of this in one chip. This is 3D heterogeneous integration. This is where the future is of nanoelectronics. This is what nanoelectronics can deliver, and that's why nanoelectronics is so important. Okay? Now, this is my inspiration. As far as I'm concerned, I look at this thing. This is a fairy fly, the smallest insect finger. This is all of it is just 200 micrometer. Okay? 200 micrometer. And guess what? In that 200 micrometer, what do you have? You have sensors. Processors, actuators, and all packaged, right? Motors, because it flies too, right? Everything in 200 microns. Get that, you know? So nature is always laughing at us that you think you're smart. <laughs> Here it is, you know, try this. <laughs> On top of that, if I tell you the functionality of this thing, look at, look at its wing, right? And look at this hair-like structure that already is at the limit of photo 
or retard. You cannot make structures like that without current photolithography. Okay? Unless you go to extreme UV and stuff like that. Nature does none of that. It does molecular engineering, molecular manufacturing to build that. And you know what these are? These are sensors. So this, this particular fairy fly, this is called a parasitoid. Parasitoid means it's uh, these are creatures which live on the infrastructure of others. Parasites. Okay? So what these insects do, they don't want to build infrastructure to lay their eggs. Okay? They lay their eggs in the eggs of other insects. Because that egg is already an infrastructure. It is at nice temperature. It's all, it's all enclosed, secluded. They go and lay their eggs inside there. That's how smart they are. Now, they are so small, you can see. So they go and on leaves of plants, on the leaves, inside the leaves, pores are there, just like our skin. Inside those pores are where those other insects have laid their eggs. Other insects. So it goes and looks for inside those pores that is there an egg there. <laughs> okay? Using these sensors. So this sensor is not only a tactile sensor. It's not only looking for that touch to see whether there is an egg there or not. It also senses temperature. That is it at the right temperature. And then they go and lay their eggs in there. Imagine the smartness of this 200 micron package. <laughs> that's our real challenge. So that's it. Thank you very much. I hope. You got some sense of technology. I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. I explained everything. You just gave me a great certificate as a teacher. Right? Everything is clear to me. Sir? Yeah. So, we are going to talk about MEMS. Now, MEMS will be replaced or will be exist? Well, it's like this, that when people built trucks and then came these tiny cars, then you say, okay, are cars, are trucks still going to exist? And the answer is yes, because they serve a different purpose. There will be lots of things which NEMS can do that MEMS cannot do. But there are lots of things that MEMS can do that NEMS cannot do. Okay, so they will exist, they will coexist. There is no question of it going out of business. Sir, can we measure the um, gravitational radiations? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. See, the gravitational radiation measurement is a tricky business, not because of uh, that you uh, uh, that there is a problem with transduction. It's not a transduction problem. It's a problem of noise. That can you measure such a small signal in overwhelming noise that we have from other all kinds of radiations? Right? So can you do that? So this uh, this is a question of signal to noise ratio. Can you build a structure? It's not about. Uh, it's not about transduction. Sensing, you know, the questions in sensing are usually about transduction. Do we have an appropriate transduction that will work at that scale? So it's not that. It's about noise. Anything else? Any other query? Any other jigyasha? <laughs> It's, it's simple microfabrication techniques. You know, you can use surface micro machining very easily. You know, so the fabrication technology as I, somehow, you know, I, I, I think that I had those slides, but uh, they disappeared or maybe they're there and I just, just one second, give me a second. So I think Dr. Prabhat, maybe in the next stop will be explaining all those things. Huh? Dr. Pramad, the the next talk will be explaining microfabrication and microfabrication. Oh, okay. Good. So there is somebody giving a talk. Uh -huh. They are here. Uh, I can show you very quickly if you like. Uh, should I or should I not be used? Let them see. Do I have to?
Another bus. <laughs> How, how this thing is uh, made, I'll show you. Um, so this is this is a cross-sectional view. You know, you take a wafer. So this is silicon wafer, and it's cross-sectional. You are looking at. Got it? Now. You know, you take any silicon wafer, if you take it out of stock, generally there will be some native oxide on it. So the first thing you do is clean the native oxide. Okay? Native oxide is either sitting there, some oxygen molecules love the silicon, they go there, they get attached, you want to remove those. Okay? That's all. So native oxide, you do RCA cleaning, it goes away. Then you actually deposit an oxide there. Right? So this is a uh, controlled growth of oxide. Thermal oxidation, wet oxidation, whatever you want to do, you can grow oxide. Now you put a photoresist layer on it. So you spin a photoresist on top. You have got a photoresist layer. You have a mask. Okay? So mask is something which has a transparent region, right? Feature that you want to write there. So we are going to make a cantilever beam, let's say. So all I want is this area to be etched here so that I can reach the silicon for anchoring the cantilever beam. Okay? So I am now going to do UV exposure. So UV exposure of the photoresist in this area where UV comes in. Right? It will break the bonds. And if then I if I develop the photoresist, if I develop it, then the photoresist is gone from there. Right? So now I have an opening there. If I do oxide etch, then oxide is gone from there, but everywhere else it is still there. So now I have opened a window to silicon. Now I deposit, let us say I remove the photoresist, okay, photoresist strip, and I deposit uh, polysilicon. So if I deposit polysilicon, it will go everywhere. So now it also goes in there. So now you have polysilicon which is here as well as here. Right? So, it is anchored. There is an anchor for the polysilicon on the silicon substrate. And on top, I, have, I pattern it and then I remove the oxide. I do the oxide edge. So now I have a freestanding cantilever beam, right? Which is anchored only in this place. This is how you make it, right? So, if you look at this, is a picture from probably 19. Uh, the two, 2002, okay? And you can see that it is a cantilever beam made exactly the way I described the process. You see this? There is the, here is the anchor, this is the beam, right? So this is the actual process. All right? So you can use processes like that. Okay. Anything else I can do for you? Any of you? You happy? Okay, very good. Thank you. My job is done. You, I have happy customers for you. <laughs> Nothing more I can do. <laughs> Thank you.